Welcome to another session of spectroscopy or analytical techniques. Today we'll understand about nuclear magnetic resonance that is NMR spectroscopy. Before we move on, subscribe for more such informative videos and tap the like button if you like the video after watching. At the end of the session, you will be able to state the principle of nuclear magnetic resonance that is NMR spectroscopy, explain the instrumentation and working of NMR spectroscopy and discuss the NMR spectrum with an example and you can understand few applications of NMR spectroscopy. First, let us understand about the principle of NMR spectroscopy. NMR spectroscopy is a technique used to determine the structure, dynamics, reaction state and chemical environment of the molecules present in the sample placed in the external magnetic field based on the absorption of radio waves. That is when the sample is subjected to external magnetic field and it absorbs radio waves based on the results we can determine the structure, dynamics, reaction state and the chemical environment of the molecules present in the sample. We all know that the nuclei of atoms have a spin and they are electrically charged. When these nuclei are subjected to external magnetic field, the axis of spin aligns parallel or anti-parallel to the axis of the external magnetic field. And we have two different types of nuclei, that is fermions and bosons. Fermions have odd number of nucleons and it will have fractional spins that is half 3 by 2 or 5 by 2 and these type of nuclei show spin. But bosons which have even mass number, it has integral spin and zero spin that is it does not show any spin and only fermions can be used for NMR spectroscopy. And we can determine the number of uh, orientation for uh, the type of fermions by this equation that is 2i plus 1 where i is the spin quantum number. So for NMR spectroscopy i is half and when we substitute half for i we get 1 plus 1 and 2 and we have two types of orientations plus half and minus half. We see that <coughs> nuclei are randomly oriented in the absence of the magnetic field. So you can see the orientations are in various directions. But when the magnetic field is applied, that is external magnetic field, we see that it is either oriented parallel to the external magnetic field or anti-parallel to the external magnetic field. And we represent the parallel spin as plus half and the anti-parallel as minus half. And this has a higher energy than the plus half. And the energy gap between these two is also important for us. And we see that the energy gap varies with the external magnetic field. More the external magnetic field, more is the energy gap between the parallel and the anti-parallel spin. And it is governed by this equation. And you can see that Bx is the magnetic field at that particular position. Here if I take this point, Bx is the magnetic field at this point. So if we can see that more the magnetic field, more is the energy gap. And another thing to note is when radio waves are allowed to pass, the parallel spin orientation absorbs the radio waves and undergo spin flip. That is, the parallel spin will become anti-parallel spin. And at this particular frequency, we say that this nuclei is in resonance with the external magnetic field. So you can understand the same thing is explained here. We can see that when the spin flip occurs, the nuclei are said to be in resonance with the external magnetic field. And we can understand the instrumentation. Here is the uh, NMR tube we call, which is 8.3 cm long and 0.3 cm dia. Although we are showing it as a test tube, it is very thin. And we place the sample inside and which is randomly oriented in the absence of the magnetic field. But when the permanent magnets are placed and the coil surrounding it, when the current flows, the external magnetic field is applied on the sample and the nuclei are oriented as parallel spin or anti-parallel spin in the presence of the external magnetic field. And now when the radio frequency transmitter which supplies powerful radio pulses, the parallel spin 
nuclei will absorb this radio frequency and undergoes a spin flip. That particular radio frequency is received by the RF receiver. And this data is processed in the data processor and it is recorded in a computer and we get the NMR spectrum. And this what is explained here, we have a sample tube where the sample is placed and magnetic coil, it generates magnetic field when the current flows through it and permanent magnet is mainly to provide uniform magnetic field and radio frequency transmitter provides powerful and short pulse radio waves and radio frequency receiver, it detects the NMR signals when the spin flip occurs and the recorder records the intensity of each signal with a specific chemical shift to give a NMR spectrum. Now we'll understand what is a chemical shift. It represents the position of the signal, that is the resonance frequency, when the spin flip occurs in the NMR spectrum of the observed nuclei, that is the sample, relative to the reference or the internal standard. Where it is denoted by this equation, that is frequency of the signal minus frequency of the reference by spectrometer frequency. Spectrometer frequency is the instrument's frequency. It can be 300 megahertz or 400 megahertz, 900 megahertz and so on. And this frequency of the signal is the, for the observed frequency of that particular nuclei of the sample. And this is the frequency of the reference. That is most often TMS that is tetramethylsilane is used as a reference whose chemical shift which is represented as delta is taken as zero arbitrarily to compare the other chemical shifts of the sample. And if deuterochloroform CdCl3 is used the chemical shift is 7.26 in proton NMR and 77 for C13 NMR, but delta is zero if TMS is taken for both proton and C13 NMR. And it is multiplied by 10 to the power of six because we are converting the whole thing into hertz because the spectrometer frequency is in megahertz and the frequency of the signal and the frequency of reference is in hertz. And we'll understand what is the chemical shift. The scale for proton NMR is zero to 10. And zero is for the reference, that is tetramethyl silane. You can see that silane is surrounded by four methyl groups and we have four into three, 12 protons. So it has very high electron density. More number of electrons are surrounding the nucleus and it is shielded. That is, it is protected. The nucleus is protected from the applied magnetic field. For, so, for the orientation to occur, we need to apply more magnetic field, external magnetic field. So, we call it as up field. For the reference, we are fixing it as zero. For any molecule which is shielded more, it will be closer to my reference. So, you can see that shielding is closer towards the reference and we call this as up field. But on the other side, if the molecule is de-shielded, that is very less number of protons are surrounding the molecule, less electron density is there and less applied field is required and the signal is away from my reference and this we call it as downfield. This is the difference between shielding and de-shielding. And now we'll take an example of an NMR spectrum that is a very simple example and you can understand what are all the informations we can gather from this NMR spectrum. Now we are taking the NMR spectrum of ethanol. It is having CH3, CH2, OH. And this is the output NMR spectrum of ethanol. What all information we can get is number of signals different types of protons present in the molecule. How many types of protons are present in the molecule can be found. Relative areas of the signal, that is in that signal, what is the relative area that can be found out. Based on this, we can tell how many number of equivalent protons are there. And position of the signal, my chemical shift. Here for methylene it is somewhere around 1 to 2 and here it is for methylene it is 3 to 4 and for hydroxyl it is between 4 to 5. So the position of the signal can be determined. Based on this I can tell what type of proton is present depending on the chemical shift.
and splitting pattern here you can see that there's a triplet here it's a quartet here it's a singlet so the splitting pattern can also be found out from this nmr spectrum so we'll see one by one in detail now we'll see the number of signals how many number of signals are there one two three so we can say that three different types of protons are present because chemically equivalent protons possess the same chemical shift for example i have three methyl protons all the three will have a same chemical shift in and around that is why we can say how many types of protons are present here we have three types of protons based on the relative areas of the signal here we should understand it's not the height of the signal it is the area of the signal so if i say area it covers the whole thing like this here it covers the whole thing like this here it is very narrow okay this is the area so the area will be more if i have more number of equivalent protons that is the same type of protons you can see that more number of protons is there in the methyl group 3 here 2 here it is 1 so the area of this methyl signal will be more and we can very well see that the area is more for the methyl and next comes methylene and although the height of hydroxyl is same because it is just having a singlet peak the area is less compared to methylene peaks so the intensity is proportional to the number of equivalent protons next comes the position of the signal that is the chemical shift so you can see this bar here from 0 to 14 here we can see approximately what type of proton is present based on the chemical shift here methyl group that is we are having saturated protons here it is between 1 and 2 so we are having 1 and 2 hydroxyl groups here between 4 and 5 so it's a wide range to which atoms it is attached based on that it can range from 0 to 5 so ours is between 4 and 5 here methylene groups see, here you can see methylene groups attached to o because it is attached to o so it is between 3 to 4 so ours is between 3 to 4 so based on the position of the signal i can tell what type of proton is present and next comes spin multiplicity or spin spin coupling or splitting pattern how that splitting pattern occurs this is based on the neighboring protons spin multiplicity rule is governed by 2n i plus 1 where i is the spin quantum number for proton nmr it is half if i substitute here 2 and 2 gets cancelled and it becomes n plus 1 so how many number of split can occur can be determined when we substitute n where n is the neighboring protons see the relative intensity intensity of each line can be understood by this pascal's triangle if it is a singlet i'll have only one peak with some intensity if it is a doublet i'll have two peaks with equal intensity how i get this one one from here and 1 plus 1 is 2 and this 1 if it is a triplet i'll get three peaks and the center peak will be two times taller than the side peaks and if it is a quartet 1 1 plus 2 is 3 2 plus 1 is 3 and 1 i'll get four peaks where two center peaks will be three times more intense than the side peaks so we can see here itself we are having a triplet okay the center peak is two times more than the side peaks we are having a quartet two center peaks are three times more than the side peaks and we are having a singlet that is having a specific height okay because it's a singlet i cannot compare it with the side peak or the center peak because we have only one peak now we'll understand for this ethanol how the splitting takes place here one thing to consider is when i have a side group like alcohols i should consider it as an independent nuclei and these protons should not be considered as a neighboring proton when i consider for this particular proton or when i consider for the adjacent proton so it is independent okay now we will consider one by one that is methyl protons here for the methyl protons i have two neighboring protons the number of neighboring protons is 
So when I substitute here n plus 1, 2 plus 1 is 3. I get a triplet. Here you can see that I get a triplet. And for methylene proton, the neighboring protons are 3 here. Because I said I should not consider the alcohols proton, 3. So 3 plus 1 is 4, so I get a quadrant. For alcohol, I should not consider the neighboring proton here because it is independent. That is, I don't have any neighboring proton. So it is 0 plus 1 and I get a singlet. This is how I get the splitting pattern for any molecule. This is a very simple example. This is how you should understand the NMR spectrum of the complex molecules also. These are few applications. I'm not really going into details of the applications, but because it's very, very, very vast field. But what we can interpret out of this NMR is chemical structure by one dimensional or two dimensional techniques. Both are different techniques. A substance should be either soluble in some solvent or it should uh, be a liquid sample. But there will be some samples which will not be soluble in any solvent so I should go for solid state NMR molecular dynamics can be studied when we study the time domain NMR spectroscopy with time what is happening the progress of the reaction all this can be studied this is all for the session and subscribe for more such informative videos and tap the like button if you like the video and share the videos with your friend let us meet in another session until then bye bye thank you